welcome back to Light the Fuse. Charles, how how you doing? I'm just going to cut it short. People have been talking about my intros and it's making me self-conscious, so I'm just cutting <laughs> it short and just getting straight to it. Charles, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. I think I think your intros are great. I think you're doing really well. All right. Well, I'm just uh, I'm a little self-conscious now, but I'm glad you're doing well. I hope everybody else is doing well. I know it's crazy times out there still. I'm sure whenever this air is still going to be crazy. But uh, you got anything we need to discuss uh, off the top or what? Uh, nothing really. No, I just, uh, you know, we, we had a blast talking to Roger and um, can't wait to have people hear everything that he has to say. He's really funny and has great stories. I was not as aware of his work when we talked to him. And uh, and then in talking to him and, and, and getting digging into his filmography, it was like, oh, my God, he's done so much amazing stuff. Yeah. And we get to ask him. Next week, we get to ask him more about some of the other things he's done from Harry Potter to Star Trek to, you know, lots of other stuff. So it's 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 good. Uh, it's it's a great interview. And I, I can't wait for people to hear it. Yeah. Um, we've talked to some of the greats uh, of visual effects, I feel like, between Stu and Todd and John and, and now Roger. I mean, these are these are huge people in the world of visual effects. It's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty awesome that we get to talk to him. Yeah. So, yeah. And Roger was an absolute hoot too so if you're thinking oh this might be dry this might no i'm sorry this is not this is not happening yeah he's very funny he tells great stories yeah he he's awesome so um i just want to tell everybody that this episode is brought to you by jeremy dylan and his podcast is called my favorite album which you should check out each week jeremy chats with a musician slash songwriter about their favorite album of all time this episode is also brought to you by john b and also Real Estate Investments, LLC, commercial real estate for growing companies. So check them out if you need their help. Uh, and that's it. Should we should we go right into it, Charles? Yeah, I guess so. Enjoy uh, Kevin Blumenfeld's plot theme, which is obviously uh, criminal. You know, and, and I, you know what I did? I did my homework. I went back and I watched the movie again last night. Oh, great. That's perfect. It was fun actually watching it. But anyway, okay. What'd you think? I I really enjoyed it. You know, it was, I mean, it's been a while. I, I mean, I think it came out, did it come out in 2006 or seven or something like that? Yeah, six. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been a while. And um, I mean, without a doubt, I, it, it brought back a lot of great memories, to be honest with you. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun making it. There were a lot of relationships made, you know, coming work, you know, in that movie, you know, it was obviously the first time I'd worked with J.J. Abrams. Um, that was, I think it was the first movie he'd done. And there were a whole bunch of us that met on that movie and we've kind of stuck together through the, you know, the five or six movies that J.J.'s made. You know, people like Tommy Gormley, the first AD, there was... Uh, Dan Mendel, you know, the DP, who's a great mm. friend of mine, and, um, you know, Colin Anderson, the camera operator. I mean, there were a whole bunch of people that, that there was, you know, JJ really got a great, really great, nice, nice group of people together. So it was fun, you know, um, thinking about those days when we first met, and we first started working on that. Well, if you have a good time on this podcast, we encourage you to t reach out to these people and tell them how how great a time you had. Because... Oh yeah, absolutely. You know that. Yeah, and and I'm sure they would they would love to share their. You know, Tommy Gormley. Have you have you spoken to him? Because no, I know he's... he's he's on the top of our list. Him and, yeah. and Dan are are definitely near the top. We would love to yeah. talk to them. Yeah, absolutely. So any you know if I can do, but but they're great guys. You know and um, and it was fun thinking about those times. I mean, partially you know when I looked at the movie. It had a certain look to it, you know, and part of that is that sort of the energy and the vibrancy that I think was totally appropriate for that kind of movie. And Dan, I'll speak on his part behalf here a little bit, was, but, you know, he was coming off doing a lot of sort of Tony Scott style stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, those kinds of movies and JJ's kind of look with the long lensy thing you know I mean and it works I mean I was watching it on my tv of course and it works really great on the on the tv I mean I, I know that there were a couple of comments that he 
you know, he was kind of in there too tight on that movie a lot of the time. But it has an energy and it has a great sort of vibrancy to it and great colours and the palette and the sort of the the energy and the, and the it's a kind of this sort of exotic thing, you know. And I, I was, to be honest, it's the first time I'd worked on a movie of that kind of style where it was truly kind of Hollywood. You were, it was international. You were going to Italy and China and it was, it was a big worldwide movie you know it was right. one of those kinds of things well yeah i mean we've talked to a few people from the movie and i guess we can just get into it right now um who who do think that it might he might have been a little too tight on a lot of things oh there you go right okay but was it was that a challenge for you on the visual effects side of things um well the you know ilm had a long history of doing anamorphic movies i mean at that time you know it's it's not that long ago it's 15 or so years ago and when we were doing the work and but of course, it's a huge, it, 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 you know, it's a tectonic shift in the kinds of technology that, you know, that were available to you. However, ILM had done a lot of film anamorphic projects. And those were the two, you know, the, the, the two, the big aspects of that show in terms of just getting, getting the data in to work on. The anamorphic lenses, obviously, the way that they work, it's a lot harder doing an anamorphic show than it is doing, um, you know, a, a show with spherical lenses. So that was a challenge, but ILM had a history of that and, and, and figuring that out. So, you know, we dealt with that. But there was a lots of tech... It, things just weren't so easy, easy as they are now, quite frankly. They just weren't. And, and mm -hmm. it's funny, you know, some of the challenges that we had um, on the show and some, some of the innovations, I mean, one of the big things was doing the mask, you know, doing that moment where he tried, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman turn, you know, changes. But one of the big, uh, big innovations um, on the show was the, um, was building Shanghai. I mean, a lot of that stuff that you see there is digital. And that was one of the first shows that ILM did where you were basically using more of a photogrammetry and photographic approach to solving like large scale, um, you know, like cityscapes. So right. we spent, you know, we spent a ton of time in, in Shanghai, Russell Earl, who was the co, you know, the co-soup on the show, you know, he spent a lot of time, we were photographing buildings and, um, you know, and then applying those as textures and photographs to geometry. And it was a, uh, and it was kind of a more of a, I mean, people have done that before, but not at the level of sophistication that we were able to with these tools that ILM had, had just re literally just built at that time. Well, I mean, can you talk about what the sort of, what were the big challenges and what were the big jobs that, that ILM had on this movie? Because they cut it. It's interesting because yeah. it kind of varies from movie to movie what you guys are sort of yeah, uh, sure. overseeing. So what, what was, what were the big things that you were tackling? I mean, with three? we, well, we did, I mean, we did, I mean, obviously we did all the effects on the show. Um, I want to say there was probably eight or 900 shots. That, I, oh, wow. you know, legally, I, I, you don't hold me to that. I can't, I can't literally, <laughs> I, my memory isn't good enough, but it's around about that kind of <laughs> thousand shots, which was a huge, you know, it was a big show at the time. The big challenges were, um, as I recall, obviously the Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, having two versions of him in the same shot and the, you know, him fighting himself and um, putting the mask on, all of those things, you know, that was a challenge. The big scene, um, which originally was scouted for Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay, I think there's an establishing shot of the convoy of vehicles going onto the bridge when they're attacked with the drone and the bad guys come off the helicopter. I mean, I, I want to say it was, a, it, was a, it was a pretty innovative approach at the time. Um, which was we built a bridge in Calabasas and we did this thing where we changed the handrail height. So we were on the top of a slope. We were on top of a hill. And basically, obviously, if you're, if you're on a bridge on water and you've got a big open ocean, you, you essentially, you're seeing the horizon, you know, for the most part. But if you, if you drop down slightly or you make the handrail rail slightly higher, you're clearly, you're just seeing sky. So... I put this to JJ that we build the bridge in Scott Shambliss. We build the bridge on this high high area um, um, out of out of Calabasas. We found some ground, so basically you were just seeing the horizon, um, which meant that you you really reduced the amount of visual effects work. And then what we had was um, Rick Rader, who was the rigging grip, 
built this system which meant that if you wanted to see the um, uh, the water or you wanted to use a green screen, then we built these green screens on the on the decks of uh, of um, trucks, and we could raise and lower them, so that essentially you could shoot stuff in camera where you were just seeing sky. And if the camera saw over the edge of the bridge, you just basically brought the green screens up and these things would go up and down in literally 30 seconds. It's one of the most, he had a background in sort of rock, rock and roll trust making and stuff like that. So he was incredibly good at coming up with these amazing salute, you know, kind of shows where the green, the green screens just pop up in an instant. And it was a, it was a great system. It was probably expensive at the time, but it was, you know, it was a big movie, but, um, it was it it worked incredibly well, and we just built the handrails just slightly higher, you know, and and so that you couldn't see over the edge quite as much as you could do on the real bridge, you know. So those those that really are paying attention, if you watch the establishing shot and then you watch the bridge, I believe the handrails just slightly different, you know, the the barriers on the edges of the road, so that you you can't quite see as much through, but. Um, mm. That was a big deal, you know, the rocket attack. I mean, I literally, it was so, so much fun watching it and thinking of all the memories. I mean, the big, you know, we did a ton of miniature work on the show, you know, all the stuff in the, um, uh, you know, the windmill farm. That was um, mainly miniatures. Uh, we did a big night shoot up at Kerna, the old, um, play, you know, the old ILM um, offices at, um, and, Pat Sweeney shot a lot of that stuff with Jeff Heron, was the pyro guy there. We, yeah, I mean, it just brought back a lot of memories. I mean, we spent a lot of time um, photographing in um, the windmill farm outside of Palm Springs. That's where we shot that stuff. We had a real Cobra and a real Huey um, helicopter for that helicopter chase. Um, there, God, yeah, there was a lot of a lot of great memories. That, one of my funniest ones about, I mean, all the interior. Huey's stuff is all shot on stage, on a green screen stage. And I still remember when Dan and I were kind of getting to know each other, Dan Mindel, I mean, and I was worried, you know, about that shoot. It's a pretty hard thing to do. You know, we're moving this helicopter around on this crazy ass gimbal um, with, the, with the actors inside. And of course, in the real windmill farm, windmill farm, if I can even say, there, were, there was virtually no lights. You know, we were lighting the, the, when we did the wide shots of the, of the chase, one of the issues is there are no lights. Why would there be in a windmill farm? You know, there are little indicators, but there's no, there's no real key light. And Dan um, started doing something, which is completely right. And, and it, was, it was a learning curve for me. It was just like swinging la lamps <laughs> through the shots, you know, flaring and lights were flying through the shots and all sorts of shit. And I, was, and I went up to him and I said, Jesus, you know, where are all these lights coming from? <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said, I'm not sure I really know, but boy, doesn't it look cool? And I was like, yeah, it really does. <laughs> and then he said, you know, don't worry, you'll figure it out. And it was a great moment, one of those moments where you realize the difference between what's real and what is appropriate for a movie. You know what I mean? It, 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 and, and it was just so appropriate. And of course, when you watch it, it's so exciting. You know, they're sliding around inside the helicopter and the lights are flying through frame. It's, 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 it's really great, but a lot of great memories. Well, are there any sort of invisible effects that people wouldn't know were necessarily ILM shots that you want to point out? Um, well, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of sort of environment work that we were doing, um, you know, throughout the, throughout the movie, I mean, literally everything really inside the helicopter is, you know, yeah, it, of course. Is, is clearly us, but that's probably more self-evident. I'm just trying to imagine um, a lot of the stuff inside. I mean, there's all these funny things that I remember, like, you know, when he's drawing on the window, the outlines of the buildings and calculating <laughs> the fulcrum and doing this yeah. fabulous math on the glass. Do you remember that moment? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it was this sort of like the dumb sorts of things that I remember was trying to make sure that the things that were drawn on the window actually lined up with the buildings. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, that's a real, it's, it's a really dumb, but real problem, you know, because he's drawing on there. And so we had to 
do a version of the composite because everything outside the windows is, you know, um, uh, you know, made up, of course. Um, so it, 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 it was just those things. I, I, I had one of those panic attacks on set where, you know, you've got to try and, re- you, you know, with the perspective and everything and you're lining this thing up, we had to sort of worry about that momentarily, about how, how would that actually appear in the movie? Did it actually make sense with the, with the skyline that we had, you know? But yeah, it's, there, there's a lot of, and, you know, you had to work harder, quite frankly, as a visual effects supervisor, you had to work harder. You had to think... Of, of things because you just couldn't fix them the way that you can now. And, you know, despite the fact that it was a big movie, you know, we did a lot of pre-planning. I mean, the shot where they're just driving along interior on the, when they enter onto the bridge, you know, they've got Philip Seymour Hoffman for the drone attacks, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting, you know, the view outside the back of the window of the um, the SUV that Tom Cruise is in, suddenly the, tre- the, the the following vehicle explodes. Do you remember that moment? Yeah. And those kinds of things, you go, okay, how are we actually shooting this? And we actually built, because you don't know what the, the real view of that is. And, you know, we built this, I remember we built this camera system where we had basically three overlapping cameras to allow you to have a shot inside the vehicle that would cover the ability for you to be able to pan inside the vehicle. So in other words, we we shot it with like a super wide camera system so that the vehicle could go up and leave frame. I mean, it's a real explosion. We did, you know, it's a real plate of a vehicle exploding, but obviously we didn't do it with Tom Cruise in the vehicle in front, it was a plate. So, I mean, I, I haven't really explained that very well, but I guess what I'm saying is there were, just, there were just so many more things that you really had to think about. Well, we, we kind of jumped into it, but we always like to ask sort of what was your relationship with Mission Impossible before you got the job? I mean, did you watch the old show? Did you, oh, I mean, my, yeah, absolutely. I mean, who didn't love the old shows? You know, as a kid, I mean, I'm, I'm of the era where that was, that was about as exciting as it got, you know. I mean, it really was fabulous stuff. I loved it, you know. And obviously, um, you know, they started making the movies. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. So the first one, I'm forgetting his name, but, the, you know, the first one was obviously very, um, you know, it was, a, it was a big thing at ILM, you know, the, the, the train sequence and all these sorts of things, and Tom on top of the train and blah, all that sort of stuff. I don't think ILM worked on two. Who directed no, two? Uh, it was the. Um... I think it was the company that did the Matrix. Is that right, Drew? Uh, right. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they, it was an Australian. I think it was an Australian company because they shot it in Australia. Right, right, and then, you know, three came along. You know, obviously for me, it was probably two years of my life or something like that, and it it was it was a great experience and and i obviously i met a whole bunch of people that have become friends it was the first time i'd worked with jj i was so impressed with jj you've got to believe there was this guy directing this movie for the first you know it was his first movie he'd done i think he'd done the pilot of lost and those kinds of things and obviously done a lot of tv but he was fun he really um had done a lot of homework on it um he knew what he wanted to do um, yeah, it, it was a great experience. And I was also remembering, of course, Joe Carnahan, what, wasn't it, that had worked on it for quite a long time before the plug was pulled on that version of the movie and J.J. came in. Were you working on the Joe Carnahan version? No. And, and, and I think that went on for, I don't know, six, I mean, it was going for quite a long time, they'd actually set up production and were, were working in Germany, I believe, before it all sort of came apart at the seams. And I don't even know the history of that, so I should probably not say any more. But, you know, one of the things that, that we discussed early on was just how much of the stuff that had they done did they want to, you know, build into, you know, our story. Um, and I believe they'd set up production in Germany or something like that and had all these cars in a warehouse. That was the thing that I remember that people constantly were talking about. What could we do with all these vehicles? <laughs> but, wow. you know, and of course, you know, it was, it was Bob Orsi and Alex Kurtzman and JJ. And they were obviously established writers, but really beginning to get into movies in a big way. And, and the whole thing has a certain energy. And what a, what a cast it has, too. Incredible cast. Yeah. 
Well, did, did you guys end up using anything from the Carnahan version or no? I don't believe we did. Okay. I mean, the, 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 the thing that I, I, I remember was that, um, you know, some of it was set in Germany and originally, you know, the, the factory piece that was, um, you know, where they set up the automated machine guns outside the factory, you know, where they go and rescue Kerry Russell. Yeah. That was originally set in, in Germany. And I seem to recall that the idea was that um, we might be able to use, you know, um, some of that, but I don't think it really happened that way. I mean, the interior of the factory was was down was somewhere in downtown LA. I remember that, and the exterior of the factory was out at Fontana. You know, that it was an old steelworks out um, way east of LA, probably fifty miles east of LA, something like that. I wanted to ask about the orange foam on the bridge that they used <laughs> uh, when yeah. they helped Philip Seymour Hoffman escape. Was that visual effects, or was it was it done practically, or how how did that work? Um, yeah, the orange foam. I mean, that's an absolutely fantastic sort of J.J. Abrams idea. And <laughs> when I was watching the movie, you know, last night, I was just thinking there are all these things, you know, where he's just got this fabulous imagination, and you know, that was one of those things. It's like, how do you get into a truck like that? So many people have just blown the doors off or done some sort of arc welding or something. He came up with this idea. I'm pretty sure it was him that he'd read that they had this idea that you could freeze steel, you know, or something like that. And that's what that orange foam was. And I'm pretty sure um, you were asking about invisible effects. Maybe it's invisible or not so invisible when you're talking about orange foam. But, you know, some of it was practical. I do remember that there was a, we built some kind of rig. Dan Sudik, who was an absolutely spectacular um, special effects guy, you know, he did a lot of these things and he's a great guy. And he, had, he got this, you know, basically did a thing where you could um, spray foam out of this gun so that they could start the thing. And then, as I recall, we actually built a piece a solid piece for the side of the truck. And then we did the kind of the in-betweens, you know what I mean? So you saw the guy start spraying the foam. And then of course the foam was going all, I mean, it would go all over the place, you know, it's completely crazy. (laughs) So we could only really kind of start it. And maybe we had a kind of a halfway foam that was, you know, was a, was a piece that you could put on the side of the truck, but we definitely had a finished piece of foam and I and I if you watch the movie actually god this is this is so funny when you suddenly have these recollections you go of course yeah if you watch the movie the foam goes from orange to white or white to orange or something towards the end which was his which was something that we obviously did which was like okay it's frozen and now you can do something and then they hit it with a sledgehammer and it collapses mm-hmm. so we had these very i think Scott built these various insert pieces that you could use and we were sort of joining the dots of how you got from a to b every time you know we moved from one piece to the next but um yeah i mean that that's how that worked um Sid Mead interestingly enough designed the the mask machine, you know, and right. JJ, yeah. you know, of course, was very interested in his work, as was I. And so that was awesome getting him, you know, involved. And he came up with the, the design of the machine and we got to, to, to talk to him about various things. And that was pretty that that was that was awesome. I love how the mask machine at the end of the process you know, has to spray the the skin color on, on the mask. It's just, yes, it's, it's so yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I, I from what I recall, you know, we had a machine. Obviously, we couldn't we couldn't cut the the mask on camera. So we were doing all that, and we were doing the doing the spraying. I mean, just just to give you an indication of just how things have changed, we shot all of the stuff with Philip Seymour Hoffman using motion control. You know what I mean? And um, watching the movie, isn't Philip Seymour Hoffman awesome? I mean, he he does such a great job. He was such a great actor. And I remember one of the things that, just as an aside, I mean, it was when he plays Tom Cruise playing him, he actually, <laughs> re- you, you know that part where he, he is, he's yeah. playing Tom Cruise playing Philip Seymour Hoffman. And yeah. <laughs> he, he, his whole body language shifts. And if you watch that, 
he he's suddenly climbing up the interior of the you know the, the somewhere in the Vatican or whatever that wherever they're supposed to be or, or whatever that thing is, and um, you know he's moving like Tom Cruise, and he 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 was such a great actor you know and and I remember JJ um, when we were doing the fight, you know what we did to do the fight with him versus him you know so we had he played both halves of it and we were trying to make it possible and 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 you know even now it would be a difficult thing to do but then it was way harder and we shot it using a learning motion control system so in other words you you do the camera move manually and then the machine learns the move and then you can play the move back so that you can pick a take and just like any great director jj hated motion control he just hated this thing. <laughs> and I don't, and we just did episode nine with motion control again. And I'm sure he was feeling his, the same palpitations that he had on mission impossible. He just, you know, it's what, it's like watching paint dry, you know, but, um, but Philip Seymour Hoffman was just, I still remember this is that, and JJ went off and started shooting something else. So I was working with Philip Seymour Hoffman to do these pieces, you know, where he is throwing himself on the ground. And we hadn't quite prepared all the elements correctly, I think, for the fight. And I'm, I'm not because Philip Seymour Hoffman said, well, I wouldn't do that. I would throw myself down and I should hit the ground hard and all these sorts of things. And suddenly he was you know, it was a concrete floor with some vinyl tiles on it or something. And all of a sudden he was just throwing himself down on the ground as though he'd been launched. And I was just like, mother of God, the guy's going to hurt himself. And, and kind of like I was sort of in charge. And I remembered this thinking, oh, my God, please stop doing that. You know, <laughs> But he was, he was just so all in. He was just totally all in. You know, he did the stuff where the chair, you know, goes down into the hole on the airplane. I mean, that was frightening. And he just, he was just, but he did that. He, yeah, but he was, he's a great actor or was a great actor, you know. That's amazing. I, I wanted to ask about the, you talked about the Shanghai stuff. There's a shot on the rooftop in Shanghai. It, mm-hmm. It's unbelievable work and it still holds up. It's this one shot where the, the camera kind of swoops in um, from wide and then, ends up on the roof with Ving Rhames and Tom Cruise and circles around them. Do you know what yeah. shot I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Was it always conceived that way as, as one shot? Well, the, the, the way that that worked was JJ in those days, actually, we were doing more previs and more boarding. And, and, you know, JJ was kind of like, okay, he wanted to kind of get his ducks in a row and, and, and make sure that we were all kind of comfortable at what we were trying to achieve. And we were looking at the boards and he had it as a wide of Shanghai and a tight of Tom Cruise. You cut to Tom Cruise on the rooftop. And me being the, well, ambitious as I, you know, in terms of the shot design, I said, wouldn't it be awesome if we went wide and you just go all the way in on his face? Now, the interesting thing about our relationship, JJ and mine's relationship, that was at a point where he knew less about visual effects than he does now. And he just didn't think that was possible. And I just thought that was a, would be awesome. And, and if my contribution it, to, to that movie, that was my, my idea to try and do that. And it caused all hell broke loose after that because to actually do it, it was a, <laughs> a, complete, it was a complete nightmare or it was extremely difficult. Um, and of course... Weirdly enough, now, you know, he would he would be in a heartbeat just saying to me, I don't want to go wide to tight. Um, you know, if you if you watch the movie in terms of his shot design as a director, it's just really interesting to me just how um, his style was so there already. You know what I mean? If you watch his movies, his whole concept, which is very much a Spielberg kind of idea, which a lot of directors do, it's certainly not the, just the two of them, but the, the idea of a developing shot. You know, you're, you're constantly in one frame, and, I just, and often in a moving frame, you're, 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 you're seeing the story develop. You're seeing, you know, I, and there are thousands of examples, I mean, literally, well, not maybe thousands, but hundreds of examples in the movie of that kind of idea. 
And that shot that you're talking about is the thing that, you know, is a classic Spielberg-y kind of thing. You don't just do a master shot and cut to the close-up. You do something which develops. You go, you see the spectacular city and you go to the close-up of the person who's seeing that view. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you're taking the audience on this great journey. And as a filmmaker, that's such a kind of J.J. Abrams type, type of thing to do. But when we actually did it, um, of course, all right, now how do you do that? Okay, we used a system, uh, I, I, it was a wire cam, it was a computer controlled wire cam system. Um, the, the top of the, okay, we'd been to Shanghai many times, we'd scouted it, we knew the layout. We, we, what we did was we built a version, a small version, I'm talking about a visible work. Really, there's only a small area of the top of that building that is built. You know, and that's on top of the um, Curious George car park at Universal in LA, okay, <laughs> at Universal Studios. So we built that where it had a, a vista of darkness behind, yeah? So now Tom is able to stand on a piece of rooftop, which is, um, you know, 120-odd feet above the ground, and he can jump off as well. He could do the jump. Then we, we built a camera, uh, a wire cam system, that you know was was based on three or four cranes, huge cranes, and they can now control the camera on these wires and go from a wide shot of Tom into a tight shot of Tom. And if you notice, the the, the of course the camera moves around his head. Yeah, it goes around his head, and then sort of resolves at the end or something, or pushes back into him or something like that. And um, of course, it was an ab it was an absolute bear to operate because of the way that the the, the system um, you know it w w you know was set up. And of course, we had to build that motion into the into the computer, the initial motion. You know, uh, Colin Anderson is operating the shot. You know, on a on a remote head, but the actual basic translation of the camera is controlled by the computer. But we still had to then join that on to everything else. We had to join it on to a wide shot, which is CG. So in other words, we go full CG of Shanghai. I want to say Richard Bluff did these big wide shots of the city, who, who's now done is the visual effects super on Mandalorian, FYI. But you push in towards, um, hopefully I got that right, not the Mandalorian part, but the fact that he did the shot in the first place. But anyway, you go wide to Shanghai, you push into Tom, which is, he's on a, a mini set. We set extended that, you go all the way around him and, um, you know, you sort of end up on this view or push into him. And if you notice, Tom is rooted to the spot because he couldn't move because we had no way of altering the path of the camera. That's amazing. Yeah. And, it, you know, in my... 35 odd years or something of being involved in this business. There's, there's my one contribution. There you go. <laughs> no. um, but, but it was, it, it's a great, it's a great piece of cinema, you know? And of course, Tom loved all that jumping off the side of the building, which was, you know, absolutely breathtaking. I just love that shot so much. And you're right that it, it fits in with the rest of the movie. I think an example of that is one of my favorite shots in the movie. There's uh, Tom Cruise is in bed with his wife and he's making the decision to, to lie to her so that he can go take this mission and the camera starts i think the scene's a wonder and the, and and uh, the camera starts down kind of on the side of the bed with cruz and then moves up above the two of them and then comes down yeah yeah to them. Absolutely. And it just it's it it tells a story you know that's those are the best kind of shots the ones that that tell a story yeah he, he he's he's so he's so good at that you know that kind of thing um, I'll tell you a funny anecdote that you could that just I'll tell you guys. It just amused me a lot. Was that obviously scouting that movie was was absolutely paramount because we we you know you were arriving on a location and you were then you know you were hoping to shoot and we were shooting in all these different places. So we we did a lot of scouting and um, Vic Armstrong, the legendary Vic Armstrong, you know was the uh, stunt coordinator and and did the second unit direction on the movie. And Vic and I wanted to have a look at that rooftop to see, I think, yeah, I think it was earlier on when we were thinking, maybe we could actually shoot that there, you know, maybe we could actually go to China and shoot a lot of that stuff on this rooftop. Um, there were a lot of reasons why we didn't, but um, we, Vic and I, I remember we left LA and we arrived in Shanghai late at night and Vic, 
um, have just bought these new glasses, right? And they were, um, he, he, he was telling me about these glasses because, you know, we got, we all got to know each other way too well. So we're, share, we're sharing our stories of, hey, I need a new pair of glasses. Hey, I've got my glasses and we're on the plane. He, ju- he just got these glasses and I think they were progressive or something like that, but they were also sunglasses. So he couldn't believe how pleased he was with these glasses. Anyway, we, we get to Shanghai, we go up, we arrive at that building, it's in the middle of the night, you know, and we get in the elevator. No, you know, I think one person could speak English. We had very little information about, you know, we, you know it's hard to um, uh, obviously communicate with people. We, we got up in an elevator, we go up through the thing, you know, it's one of the tallest buildings in the world, we, I still remember this moment. We get up in another service ele- elevator. We go to the thing. We walk down a corridor. The guy opens the door. All I see is black. We, I step, put my head through the door. It's a complete, it's a sheer drop. It's probably, I think, I, I can't even remember how tall those buildings were. A thousand feet, you know. <laughs> it was, there was a, probably an eight inch ledge and then it was just an open door to the outside world. I've never in my life, I was like, holy shit. Anyway, Vic said, okay, well, we can't, we can't see from here. We need to get up on the roof. Anyway, we get up on the roof, which is where you see that moment take place. And if you, if you, if you recall, there's a, an antenna on the side of the building and it's, and it's held to the building with these I-beams, Okay. So we're up there and we've, we've been on this 18 hour, you know, trip to get there or 20, probably longer, you know, I'm absolutely exhausted. It's the middle of the night. Vic says, I want to see what's over the edge of the building. So he stands on the eye beams and I'm standing quite close to the edge of the building. We're, you know, 900, a thousand feet up. I was thinking, holy shit. He gets on the eye beam and he walks out on the eye beam and looks over the edge, at which point I probably have a heart palpitation, but his glasses, when he looks down, his glasses fall off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And they fall, they just disappear. And he try, He goes to catch them with his free hand. He's got, so I, I for the love of, I mean, I literally almost had a heart attack I, and I just shouted, Vic, for God's sake. And he comes back on this I beam. Okay, he's cursing now because he's lost. He's had these glasses for one day, right? <laughs> <laughs> one, one fucking day. Anyway, so he's effing and blinding. I said, for God's sake, Vic, you know, he said, we can't go down there. He said, we'll probably find some poor guy with the glasses embedded in his head, you know. But anyway, it was the <laughs> middle of the night. There was no one around. I said, we, we, you know, of course, we don't need to worry about that. Anyway, so... We get to the car, we're about to go back. He's still cursing. I said, you know what? I'm going to go and have a look. It was a big car park at the base. I walk out to the car park and it's just this massive car park. I look around for two seconds and I see the glasses. They're just sitting on the ground, just perfectly. (laughs) They're just sitting like someone has placed them there. I walk over, I grab the glasses and um, walk back to the car. I said, look, here you go. This is your early Christmas present. He can't believe it. Anyway, it just always amuses me. Every time I see that building, I think of him and those glasses falling off. Isn't that a funny story? Anyway, oh but... Now everyone who hears this story is going to think about that too when they yeah. watch the movie. Yeah. <laughs> but you probably want to hear more interesting things than that anecdote. Anyway. No, that was wonderful. They didn't break at all? No, they were just sitting there. I, here, I could damp. They were just sitting there like that on the ground. Here, you know what I mean? Like that. I was like, what? Wow. Yeah. Perfect. Do you, here we have to ask you. We ask everybody that was involved in Mission Impossible Three. Do you know what the rabbit's foot is? Of course you don't. No, of course. I mean that's just the fun, half the fun of it. I mean, you know the what is it? What's in the box? You know, yeah. it's one of those J.J. Abrams thing. You didn't I ask think, J.J. You, like. Just of course tell me we what did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we all theorized about it, and and maybe at the time we came up with some, you know, conclusion about what 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 was in there. Um, but it, yeah, it was, I'll tell you another funny anecdote was if you notice JJ gets a, a, a visual effects credit. Did you know that? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and he was 
really interested in what we were doing and how we were doing it. And one of the things was he couldn't believe how good the people were at um, painting stuff out in shots, you know. And we had a fantastic person leading that team, Beth Tomato, and she was awesome. You know, she, you could give her a scene with some weird art, you know, thing in it that you didn't want to see and she would paint it out. And she was fantastic at that. Anyway, so JJ, when Carrie Russell's head explodes, you know, JJ was all in on that moment. And he was, you know, I want it to be kind of gnarly. And, you know, if you look at it, there's that weird kind of eye twitch that she does when the charge goes, it's kind of weird. Her eye shifts across and, and originally most of the takes were shot with this splat of blood across her face and across, I think it was across Tom's. Okay, now I'm going to screw up the story. But No, that's true, yeah. Yeah, it's on Tom's face. That's right. Mm-hmm. You, you reversed onto Tom and you, he got hit with this blood. JJ was like, this is awesome. You know, this is what I want in the movie, the blood splat. Anyway, it turned out that that was one of the big ratings things, that, that they didn't want this blood splat thing. Of course, virtually every take he, he had, or all the good takes, had the blood splat. So he says to me one day, he said, you guys do this all the time. I'm going to paint the blood out. So I'm going to do it myself. This is going to be one of the, my contributions to the movie. I'm going to learn more about visual effects. He comes up and spends a few hours with Beth, and she explains his, her approach. Anyway, he goes back and starts trying to do it. Of course, it's an absolute nightmare. You know, because <laughs> removing blood off a moving person's face, I mean, it's hideously difficult to do. You know, every frame is different. And we would just laugh our asses off because he would show us his progress or, and, and then he stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and Beth and I would be looking at this, trying to be as encouraging as possible. But, you know, I mean, it was just hideous. And I... <laughs> And uh, in the end, Beth just said, I mean, it was just, he just was, he was just like, okay, right, just show me how to do it. And she sat down and did it, you know, and of course, and I'll say 10 minutes, of course, which is completely wrong, but, you know, but she did it in, in a fraction of the time. But anyway, that, but that was one of the things he was sort of interested in was just those, well, the visual effects and, the, and, and, you know, that his inquisitive mind. And of course, it's very, it was a lot of fun having some, working with somebody who was just so into it all, you know? Yeah. We interviewed Todd Vaziri, who worked on Ghost Protocol and MI3 at ILM. And there's a shot in the movie uh, where, during the heist at the Vatican, Jonathan Rhys Myers shoots this uh, homing device thing onto a, a yeah. sewer cap. Yes. And this little hair is, the, I thought it was like a hair that was trapped in there, but I guess it, uh, uh, Todd says he thinks that that was an antenna that was springing up. Is that what that is? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I just I yeah. love that that little flourish of the little the little thing popping up. I think it's just so cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was you know um, that was actually all shot at um, I want to say it was Caserta, you know, in in southern Italy. You know, that whole the the the, the Vatican. I mean, I shot some of the pieces of of a stunt double going up the wall, the exterior of the wall. Uh, you know, when he goes to do the run, you know, I think there's a shot where he it widens out and he runs back and he goes up and you see the town or, or you see what's supposed to be Rome and we shot plates of Rome and then put them. But that was actually shot, some of that was shot at Caserta because we couldn't find a street where, or in time, where you got um, a, good, a, a good view down the road. But yeah, Todd, I mean, Todd is all over this, you know. I mean, he, 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 he did a bunch of... Fab, fabulous stuff you know in the in the in the movie you know actually to be honest with you i i'm i look at the work and i still think i mean i think a lot of it holds up pretty well you know um oh yeah well i i, I was just going to say the one moment that i'm, I'm just going to say bumps me slightly and i remember discussing this with jj even at the time was the moment where the rocket which i just don't like that moment where the rocket does this kind of implausible thing where it flies past the camera where it goes down and hits the bridge it really jumps out at me because it seems a different kind of filmmaking and anyway i i that was the only thing there you are i'm sharp showing sharing my Deep, deepest and darkest secrets in terms of just the the, the 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 work, but there's so much of it, you know, that um, I think I think works pretty well, and it and it was just so 
it, it, was, it was definitely a different time, you know, a time where you really had to plan, you know, all of the different, um, different events. I mean, going back to the bridge, it, this is a, a silly anecdote too, was when the bridge um, sort of blows up and you see the big hole cut in it, you know, there were, I still remember this, this is so funny too, it's just Vic Armstrong, I think, was sort of explosioned out at that point. And of course, so much of that moment fell to the second unit in terms of doing all the big explosions and the helicopter stuff and all of that kind of thing. And I was working pretty pretty closely with Vic at that time. And Vic and I would constantly be arguing about the size of the explosions. I wanted to go large and Vic wanted to go smaller. He was saying, this is a more realistic size. And Dan Siddick, the special effects guy, was going, yeah, it's a movie. Look, we should just blow the shit out of this thing, you know. <laughs> and, and I was kind of at the same school of thought. You know, you don't want the bad guys to turn up and for them to have these kind of small explosions. It just didn't seem right, you know, for the movie. Anyway, we had many discussions. And on a couple of occasions, Vic told Dan off for making the explosions too big. Anyway, so this is... This is my remembrance of the anecdote was we then come to do the biggest explosion on the bridge and the entire crew is there, including JJ. And we've set this shot up. He turns up to see this because it's a huge, well, going to be a big explosion. Dan looks at me and says, I've done this for you, Roger. I have loaded the shit out of that thing. (laughs) (laughs) He said, this thing is really going to go. And... There's going to be, you know, and I was always talking to him about trying to include those kind of military looking kind of shooters that you get in explosions to make it look more technical, you know, like these phosphorescent things that you that you get more in sort of military um, things. Anyway, so he goes, I have loaded the shit out of this thing. He looks at me and he goes, do you want to hit the button? And I, I look and I literally look around and I'm going holy shit, you know, and I'm looking because it is the hottest bone dry day you can ever imagine. And I'm just thinking these shooters and I look around and he, and by the time all of this is processing, they've already called action and it's kind of three and it, now it's in slow motion for me. And he's going three, two, and he, and he goes, boom, it hits this thing massive explosion these shooters go flying and i just watching them landing and we've got the fire service and everything out there boom instant fires they're all over the place well the local fire guys have do that kind of weird thing where they freeze because it's a movie and they've forgotten that they're actually the firemen (laughs) and (laughs) and the whole area is suddenly on fire and but the special effects team that there are many of have water trucks and they get this thing out. They get the fire out. But we've burned quite a lot of area of the land. And <laughs> and I'm going, you know, geez, you know, that was close. And Dan, of course, you know, he's a fantastic guy and did a fabulous job with the explosion. And Vic is probably cursing us because we've made this thing too big. And JJ is kind of going, oh my God, this is awesome. Um, but we obviously almost set fire to the area. And there's all this stuff about different plants and you can't you know people you know different types of frog or whatever it all things that lived in this area over at calabasas but we've we've saved it anyway a cut to i think six months later the or three months later the entire area burnt down do you remember that that huge calabasas fire mm-hmm. i went out there so it must have been maybe a couple months after we shot i went out there the only thing that survived was our bridge wow <laughs> Oh, wait, so is is that bridge still out there? No, they, 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 they had to take it down. But, you know, it must have been within our production that that fire happened. Because I remember I drove out there and literally the only thing that survived was our bridge. That's insane. Wow. Roger, part one. It's in the books. Yeah. I love that guy. That was an amazing interview. 
Again, I always tell people these interviews are great not because of us, but because of the people we talk to. Yes. And he is no different. He is so awesome. Yeah. So many great and funny stories. And I love I love him talking about learning from Dan Mendel about what's real versus what's good for the movie. You know, when, when Dan Mendel was like sh- flashing all these lights that didn't really make sense in the uh, in the windmill farm. And Dan Mendel was like, but it looked cool. <laughs> and uh, to ha- Roger talking about how he, that was like an important lesson that he learned that, it, you know, and then when you see it in the movie, it doesn't really matter. And it's not, nobody questions whether or not that makes sense in that moment, uh, which I thought was really Did cool. Did he talk about going out to the bridge in this, in this episode? I think so. I think this was about the, yeah. Cause I think next week is a lot of, about a lot of other movies. Um, and this was mostly just MI3. He also talked about, uh, I thought it was cool, him talking about how J.J. has a, a Spielbergian shooting style of, you know, having shots develop and how he um, was able to put that into some of the visual, some of the visual effects as well. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just I'm excited. Next week is really cool. You got to come back because he talks about Mars Attacks, Star Trek, Pirates of the Caribbean, Harry Potter, both Harry Potter, the first movie and also working with Alfonso Cuaron. He has a great Cuaron story about doing uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. And then he also talks about the shining sequence in Ready Player One. So that's all next week. You got to come back for that. It's really great. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's amazing. And uh, we've got some people to thank this week. Right, Charles? Yes. Yeah. A very special thank you to Derek Klingle. And uh, it, speaking of which, you know, if you want to help us out, uh, go to our Patreon. Our Patreon subscribers are so awesome. They've helped us out so much. And uh, if you want to take part in it and you want bonus content, check it out. It's patreon.com slash light the fuse. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing bonus episodes every week. Uh, we give you sneak peeks of upcoming episodes. We talk about uh, some of our favorite movies. You know, we have bonus sections of interviews and stuff. I mean, it's all, all kinds of great stuff. And, uh, you know, if you sign up, try it for a month. It's only five ninety five for the bonus content. And uh, you can binge all of our crazy content because we've got commentaries for all the six movies and all kinds of stuff. And then uh, if you feel like you want to stick with it, then stick with it. But uh, yeah, give it a shot. And if that's not something that interests you, then, uh, then check out our Tee Public page. We're selling uh, shirts and mugs and magnets and stickers and pins. And also they're selling masks. And the masks, for every mask that they sell, they also donate one that is FDA certified or approved or whatever for a hospital that is in need and needs those supplies. So it's uh, helpful. So, you know, it can get a mask that says light the fuse on it or one of our logos or, you know, there's all kinds of fun stuff on there. So check that out. Uh, and our Tee Public page is linked from our website, which is lightthefusepodcast.com. Also follow us on social media. It's uh, at lightthefusepod on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, what else, Drew? Anything else? Just tell tell people you like the show and tell people to listen. Because I feel like, you know, people need things to listen to these days and they love recommendations from people they trust. And hopefully you're a trustworthy person. I'm not going to make that assumption, but <laughs> let's go out of our way and <laughs> say that. And so just tell people, tell people to listen, rate and review it wherever you listen to it, since we're on so many different platforms. And also tell us what you'd like to see and what you'd like to hear going forward, because... We are always looking for new suggestions, both for the Patreon show and for the main show. And um, I'm I'm very excited about our guest list for the next few months. But, you know, if there's somebody you think we should seek out, please let us know. We're happy to do it. We've literally got nothing else to do with our lives. And uh, the show <laughs> has consumed all of our free time and alienated us from our wives and families. So just let us know. Just let us know. <laughs> Because we're, we're always willing to do it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we'll be back next week with part two of Roger Guyette, legendary visual effects master. So come back for that. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.